concept designer, uh, thought provoker, and artist extraordinaire. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Joyner, live on the floor. Hello. High five, Paul Gabriel. Hey, everybody. All right, I'm a thought provoker, but the, instead of my presentation, I think we're going to focus on In-N-Out Burger today. So, no, just kidding. Um, so yeah, he said, uh, my name's Ian Joyner. Uh, I've been around for decades now, apparently, but um, I guess that's kind of true. Um, so yeah, I've been in the industry for a long, long while now. Um, I actually started off in production uh, long before anything. I was doing illustration and graphic design and motion graphics, but I fell in love with 3D. And uh, I actually fell in love with it and won a copy of ZBrush, I think it was one point something, 1.2 or one, whatever it was. This is before Subtools, this is before, obviously before Dynamesh, this is before pretty much ZBrush was anything like we know it as it is now. It had a lot of promise, but I didn't really see what the point was just yet. I entered a contest, I won this thing, it's like, it's really cool, but it doesn't really do what I wanted to do. A friend of mine, happened to be on the beta for, uh, I believe it was 2.5, which is what the two towers around there. And he goes, you got to see what they're doing. I said, oh, I would love to. And that's when I met Jaime and uh, on the phone. And they got me into the beta. And it changed everything. It literally went from I was doing everything poly modeling piece by piece by piece and making organic stuff that I thought was pretty cool to going, oh, this is actually an artist tool. It was still very rudimentary compared to what we have now. So I'm not going to show anything that old, but I will show a little bit of stuff that um, after I started doing that, I ended up working at, uh, at Blur Studios. Um, you guys might be familiar with them. They are awesome, and they continue to become more awesome all the time. Uh, they, I was there from 2003 to about 2006, I want to say. And um, what a place to work. I mean, what a first big job in the industry. I, learned about what real production um, uh, really needs and also what timelines really mean. Uh, the, the idea was you don't just jump in there and like, oh, I'm gonna sculpt something cool and that's it. It was, you got usually five to 10 days to do a complete hero character with materials, with hair, with textures, everything. So that was a big wake up call for me. Um, but I learned a ton there and grew as an artist. So one of the things I would do there is always try to get ZBrush more involved in the early pipeline for fleshing out characters. This wasn't always really doable though because of our timelines and also just the retopping tools and everything that we have today just didn't exist. So I still would oftentimes try to do everything from scratch either in Max or ZBrush, but um, now it's just commonplace. You can just jump right into ZBrush, make whatever you want, it's awesome. Um, but I, I watched the program actually develop at my time there and become something that went beyond production tool because we were using it mostly for detailing and pushing things around a little bit. And suddenly I started going, God, I could, I could do concepts with this. Like, I'm much stronger in 3D than 2D. So I, uh, I left Blur and I started doing freelance. I started doing a lot of work that was uh, concept 3D sculpts. So they'd have a concept design that they kind of liked. And then they would say, let's do a cool sculpture of this. Let's, let's evolve it in 3D. But it didn't have to worry about all the uh, nitty gritty production work. And I would also do the nitty gritty production work. But I loved doing the concept side. So, I kept trying to find a way to make this more quick, faster, faster, faster. And I did freelance for about three years, everything from game work to some film work, uh, cinematic work a lot of. And uh, then I met um, uh, the guys at Stan Winston Studios, in particular uh, Scott Patton. And he showed me some of the work he was doing in ZBrush that was really beautiful work. And I said, wow, that's really great. Um, like, how long did those take? He goes, well, I did those three in a day. Okay, you're doing full color, beautiful looking stuff in ZBrush in a day. Like, that's pretty impressive. Um, so I showed them my work. Uh, they liked what they saw, I guess, enough to give me some freelance work. And I had my first meeting for some freelance work at, I think it was 2 o'clock. And they said their turnaround was for 5 o'clock. They had to turn it in. So I turned back around, did all this work, had to make this little space suit that was going to be 3D printed. And at this point, I'd only done some 3D prints for the fun of it, never for something that needed to be worn and actually. Um, done in the correct way. They had a couple other stipulations. The left and right side, whatever the design was, had to be able to just be the same arm. So I made a little scoop in the design where I could cut off one side or the other and put a shoulder pad on there so the left and right were the same. Same with the legs. Learned a lot about not just the digital side while, while doing this, but learned a lot about the practical side. Um, then they started on Iron Man 2. 
and they said, look, you've done a bunch of work for us, but if you're gonna work on this movie, you're gonna have to come in and do full on, like, in-house work, working with the guys at Marvel, this is gonna be a whole other level of stuff, and it's gonna have to fit on people and be engineered. Um, so that was my first big gig there. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit more of that later on, but um, the idea is that I went from production to full on into 3D printing and practical effects and learning all of this uh, amazing side of the industry that was really my first passion, so it was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so what we're gonna talk about a little bit today, among other things, is my pipeline kind of how I go about creating stuff uh, quickly and how I'm able to do a lot of uh, ideation as fast as possible. So to begin with, um, I'm pretty sure you guys are all familiar with Dynamesh. Um, I don't think at a conference like this we're gonna have too many people who go, what's a ZBrush? It might happen, it has happened before, but um, Dynamesh was the big game changer. So before that, we, I would do a lot of stuff with Z-spheres or I'd take old meshes and just kind of rip them around to make my characters. Dynamesh changed it so that suddenly I almost, every single time I start a new design, I'm starting from a sphere. Um, I just like that, I like that workflow. It's very freeing as an artist to not be constrained to your, um, to your base meshes. And I teach a class at uh, Concept Design Academy, and it's one of the first things I do is give them a simple head base mesh. And I say, everyone take this, we're gonna do three characters based on this, you know, whatever it's gonna be, I think I have some witch examples in here. Um, but the idea is they need to look different on all levels. You can't have them look like three things with different detail. I want them to look like completely different characters from the same base mesh. Now, this is not using Dynamesh. This is just using subdivisions. The next thing I do is let them jump into Dynamesh and play from a sphere. But I figure give them something to, to begin with. Almost without fail, at least half the class when they turn in their homework has three heads that are just lightly detailed. The eye placement, nose placement, mouth placement is exactly where the base mesh was. So, what I love about the Dynamesh workflow is that just gets you away from being constrained by your, your, your base, by getting away from your armature. So here's a very old example, but um, of kind of some of my workflow. So the one you see on top there is a rough uh, Dynamesh sculpture. They we're doing the mentors for uh, Harry Potter redesign stuff. So then these were just a bunch of random faces I painted over in Photoshop. Now, as the tools have gotten better and I've become more comfortable with it, I do less and less in Photoshop like this and more and more directly into ZBrush. And we'll show some examples of that soon, too. And there's the final image all comped together, soul-sucking, little cartoony kind of fun thing. Um, but this whole sculpt was a Dynamesh sculpture uh, taken to a, to a level by, ta um, we'll do a little example of this, but basically roughing out a skeletal form putting them into place, dynameshing it together, remeshing it, extracting to make cloth, all of this, and it was done very, very quickly. Uh, Polly painted the works. So here's those witches we talked about. So one of the reasons I still like Photoshop for this is that these three sculptures here are, um, are very different in terms of their bases, but I didn't do any detailing. I just took them into Photoshop, did some really quick little line work on them, and that gave me my three different characters. Uh, so I still jump back and forth between these two workflows. I still think there's a lot of power in the 2D, there's a lot of power in the 3D, but what is amazing about ZBrush is that that line has become so blurred now that it doesn't even matter. Whichever way you want to work is going to be just fine. Um, some other examples of some of the, uh, the Dynamesh work. Um, so if you see here on the left, it's, this is a Fenrir Greyback from the Harry Potter redesign that we did in class. Um, the first mesh was very rough. It was just an anatomy study. I didn't take it very far. Uh, I might take it a little further these days because I'm just more comfortable with the tools. But I remeshed this and then was able to detail it all up very, very fast. And there's the final image for that. Um, all of these images you see are actually not rendered in Keyshot, they're rendered in ZBrush using uh, comp passes. I still love that workflow. Keyshot's amazing, so I don't want anyone to think I'm speaking ill of it because I use it all the time and it's, it's amazing, amazing uh, game-changing software as well. But uh, there is something I really love about ZBrush renders. They're a little more illustrative. They have, uh, everyone has a little bit more of a voice, I've noticed, with them. Um, they always look different. I can almost tell someone's ZBrush renders, and I can tell who worked on them based on the final image. Keyshot, because it's so precise and so real world, can sometimes be very um, uh, product friendly. So it becomes harder to get your voice back into it. And it takes, you have to really learn the, the, the way of painting with it to kind of bring back in your own personality. Uh, which sometimes you don't want. Sometimes you want it just to look like this is what's gonna show up on your set, and for that, nothing can beat that program. 
Um, some more old renders I did for Snow White and the Huntsman. These were some designs for these tree creatures. Uh, we had a day to do these. It was for the sizzle reel. Um, this was very, very fast. We took some photos of some trees outside, scanned them in, um, uh, not scanned them, I'm sorry. This is digital, it wasn't that old. Uh, and then I used those textures, made alphas and things, sculpted out rough forms and just started stamping stuff on there, used some tube brush to get some fun stuff. And uh, this was pre-Dynamesh, so what I was doing here is to make some of these little cut areas, I actually just went in Photoshop and painted with the bloom light behind it. Um, very, very fast, and then we did a lot of different ideation on, on the faces, on where these things might go. More nth like more, you know, kind of weird golem old man things. Um, but this was done for a sizzle reel, so it was very, very fast, no, no budget, whatever. Once it was finished, the guys in the shop actually ended up sculpting this thing from scratch. So this uh, was the character for Cowboys and Aliens. Um, this thing is uh, pretty interesting on a few levels. It was a, a big um, evolution for me as an artist. Uh, we started off doing really rough sketches. Everybody, I think there was like 50 different designs that we did just at Legacy for this movie among all the other talented people you know, from all over the area who were doing designs for this. Um, ours were picked and we kind of made a hybrid version from uh, Scott's and myself's and uh, we kept evolving it until we kind of got to this final design. What was cool about this is that we milled out the big body, and I'll show some examples of that in a second, but the body was actually a big foam bill that they went in and carved and were able to retain the detail and bring back in uh, some of the stuff that was sculpted in ZBrush. It just would have been too expensive to do. The head, however, was the first time that we did something that was organic to this level, and we actually printed this thing uh, and molded it, and we're able to get every little pore you see on this was actually showed up in the print. Some more rough concept of uh, maybe how it would stand. There's a whole bunch of these things. So here's one of the early maquettes that we did. This is uh, kind of a fun character because he was very transformative. If you look over in the uh, bottom right, you'll see his chest cavity without the little arms, and he had these arms that stuck out. And a fun thing about this is the head design. Um, we had it locked. We thought everything was great. And literally, we're about to start making this thing. It was already, I think, being printed. And um, the trailer for Clash of the Titans came out, and the Kraken was shown, and it was gray. It had a ton of eyes, it had a ton of teeth, and it, would just, it looked so similar to what we were already doing, we had to call the studio and say, we need to rethink this. So when we made the maquette, we ended up doing, I think, six different head designs, making them magnets, and just being able to pop them in and out. So instead of looking just at ZBrush renders, we were also putting them into this actual maquette to look at. And here's one of the final paint ones. Uh, the very talented people there. I believe Trevor Hensley did the paint job on this. I could be wrong, and if I am, I apologize. But uh, anybody there, they're all super, super talented guys at Legacy. So, um, And here's some of the prints. You can see uh, the blue one there is the, the initial design um, 3D printed on an object machine. The one over uh, in the gray is actually a clay pour where they were going to detail it up because at first we just did this print thinking it would be a cool piece, but we got so much detail on this when we had to redesign the face a bit, we ended up not needing to do the clay pour on any of it. We ended up just printing the thing out and then only doing clay in the back in areas that weren't as uh, costly um, to do the detail. It was a pretty interesting uh, learning process on this one. I had to do a lot of engineering. Uh, further on, you'll see this is the old print when everything was just part of it. And here's the final design where if you look, you can see some of this pore details in there. These little flaps on the cheeks were separate pieces that were engineered off of it so they could, um, you know, flare out with little bladders. The eyes were going to push through with these little kind of sphincter eyes, so those were separate, going to be in a very rubbery uh, material. Um, so this was a, you know, and if you look, we look at this now, I kind of laugh because it was just so rough. We didn't really know about the engineering that we know now where everything could be perfectly done. But it worked, worked just fine. Um, there's me standing next to the giant foam builds trying to figure out what head size it was going to have. Uh, you could see it was a very big creature. And uh, we made a puppet out of it, obviously. I think in the final movie, most of it was all digital, um, just because they're tough to maneuver around. But there's a few close-up shots, so we use these. There's a lot of dead bodies. And it was great lighting reference, I think, for the guys at uh, ILM. Um, in the corner over here, you might see this little rabbit in the corner. That was one of my first designs I did for Legacy. Uh, didn't know what the heck happened to it, and found out that it was uh, actually already filmed and finished uh, by the time that I had my next meeting. So it was uh, very rapid fire there. Um, another other one is th to go over really quick is uh, for Neighborhood Watch. Again, an alien. We didn't know what it was supposed to be other than bipedal. And was it going to have multiple things? Was it supposed to have a face? Was it supposed to be kind of comical? We just didn't know. 
So we did a bunch of designs, just three that I had uh, just to grab. And then this is pretty close to the final design used in the film. Um, I have a little bit more saturated colors on this one than we, than we end up using. Uh, a couple key frames of what it would look like in certain poses they wanted to sell the idea of. And then we got to do maquettes on it. If you look in the upper left corner, you'll see a ZBrush render. That is a, um, just straight out of ZBrush. Uh, that looks like John Sharefka is doing the paint job on, um, on the actual maquette there. And in the background, you can see some of the concept art. And then the final production pieces are at the bottom there. Now what's interesting is, because of the rapid fire nature of these and also, and also the budget, sometimes we don't mold these. So we just do them right out of the resins, which is great if you're in an environment that's completely controlled. However, oftentimes you're bringing these around in Hollywood, you know, in the desert, wherever you're gonna be, 115 degrees out, well, those little tiny little legs and stuff start to kind of warp and fall down and you know, heat it up and move it back into place. Uh, on this character in particular, I, ma I made this base for it. Um, and I saw his legs are off balance, one's higher, one's lower. The idea being that when I put the base on, it would look just right. Well, when they first got it, they thought that I had made a mistake, so they had to heat the, the resins to kind of move it so that it would end up uh, standing straight, and the base came out a few days later, and they went, oh, I see. So um, sometimes communication is really important, <laughs> but uh, sometimes you work with a team who's able to fix things on the fly, and it's not a big deal. But communication is pretty important. Um, so again, we didn't have the budget to do um, expensive prints on these, so we did mills, and the amazing team here um, did all this uh, lovely sculpting back onto these uh, milled jobs. We pushed the detail and used a really nice foam on this so that uh, got us pretty much all of our primary and secondary detail, but all the little tertiary fun stuff was just gone. So these guys had to go back in and try to sculpt some of the ZBrush stuff I did onto this, which uh, I remember Aki saying that, um, you could sculpt this in ZBrush, but you can't do this in foam. And yet, they totally nailed it, and it looked fantastic when it was done. So, um, and here's the final suit with uh, Doug Jones wearing it. Um, really fun project to work on. You know, I don't, I still haven't seen the film, but uh, I often don't watch the movies. So, <laughs> it was great, right? Um, so here we go with the lizard. Uh, a ton of people worked on this, this this character early on. I did some very early pitch work, um, and then was off it for a while and came back toward the end where all sorts of amazing artists had either gotten their fingerprints onto it. So, you know, I never want to say that, like, this is the, this was my design. This is a collaborative effort. Everything you do in movies is a collaborative effort. And, uh, but I got to do the final sculpt on him and kind of blend in the actor and uh, did some anatomy changes and scales, lots and lots of hand sculpted scales. Uh, my boss at Legacy, Shane Mahan, amazing guy, talented guy. Um, hates the fact that digital often looked so symmetrical. So when we're working on this thing and we're still figuring out the patterns, he said, no, 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 you, we gotta hand tool the scales on this guy. We gotta go Jurassic Park on this. Even though we're doing digital, let's really go in there and, and sculpt them one by one. So if you look at them, you could kind of tell the areas that I did one by one and the areas that I made some uh, alphas to just fill in the detail. So in the end, the best thing was to do kind of a hybrid. The big ones you see in the kind of shoulder areas, his upper shoulders, his entire face pretty much was done hand sculpted one by one. There was probably like 20 different main scale designs before we picked this one and went and refined it. Um, but this was my final image that kind of got the approval. And uh, this is um, the maquette uh, final before growing that was a half scale and this character was gigantic, so we'll see it in a moment. But um, the guys at, I believe it was Ironhead, initially did this beautiful maquette in Chavant, absolutely beautiful. Um, we ended up changing some of the uh, anatomy on him, so I had to do a lot of changes. So I had to take their maquette, they scanned it, um, and then unpose it, because it was in this pose, and then redo the anatomy proportions a little bit, all this little, little subtle stuff, and then a lot of uh, detailing work, because the, the initial one was really just a beautiful form study with some initial detail. So we ended up going in and uh, I tweaked the anatomy a heck of a lot. I uh, did all the scaling you see, uh, hands, claws. You know, he's got the three fingers on one hand because it grows out. Um, what was fun about this was the fact that we weren't sure what we were gonna do for the final pose. So we did a ton of different poses. In the end, they loved that one, so we ended up just reposing it back into that position. So it's kind of funny, you take this thing that's in this wild pose, make it kind of boring, work on it, put it back in a bunch of different poses. They, like the, they pick it to pick the one they like, and then we print it out, and I'll show you guys. These are the, um, ooh, let's ignore the spelling mistake there. Um, these are the, uh, I think these are the large scale ones. We did two different sizes, one about uh, 12 inches tall and one about, Gee, what would you say, probably three feet tall, maybe, eh, probably bigger than that, probably four feet tall, um, 
of the life-size one. Now, what's cool about it was since it was from our digital asset, there was no difference from the small to the large. It was exactly the same. The difficulty with that is that one printer is a very expensive, awesome printer that does every detail you can imagine, and so the small scale didn't really have to work too hard to get that. The other printer uh, uh, was actually much more lossy. So we had to crunch the detail and send little scale patterns out to see which level would look okay. And if you saw the ZBrush file for the large one, it looks really sloppy because we had to overdo every single detail in the right areas so that when it printed, it softened down to where it should be. Um, very interesting learning process on that one. And here you see uh, a whole slew of them all painted up, small and large. Um, I think Trevor painted these, but I don't know for sure, so I'm not going to say because I don't want to discredit anybody. Um, but you can see we have uh, different heads, the half-scale maquette over here, all from digital assets. And more and more we're doing that with organic stuff. Very rare do you see the, uh, especially legacy, um, do you see the sculpted, um, the sculpted work uh, done just in clay. A lot of times we actually do it digital now. Now I left legacy about six months ago to be a freelance artist. I'm still very uh, friendly with all those guys and uh, as you can see the work they do is just phenomenal. These paint jobs, they put glass eyes in him, so it just looked, uh, looked great. And then we go to, again, back to concept design. And I think I still have some time, right? Cool. So I'm going to rush through the presentation, then we'll do some live demo stuff. Um, so these guys are really fun. Um, this is before DynaMesh. So this is my old workflow, and I still kind of use a hybrid of this with DynaMesh now. But all, we had the brief, basically, that they needed some designs for these rats that we're going to transform. So what I did first is I took a uh, simple rat and remeshed it. I believe I had to do that in uh, a program called Clay, which was an old beta program we used to use a lot because we didn't have the cool remeshing tools we have now. Um, but I made a very simple rat. It was just enough that I could go, okay, that's a rat silhouette. Then I started doing a bunch of different uh, profiles and, and views of these creatures. What was nice about this is because it had the same base mesh, if they said they liked A and B, but maybe split the difference, I could set morph targets and just go 50%, how about that? Or use the morph brush and go, okay, the head's going to be big, the tail's going to be this. So I still use this workflow a lot. You can't really do this with just DynaMesh. So um, if you guys are like really into ZBrush, but you don't like the technical side, you don't like the remeshing, you don't like all that, you're limiting yourselves because there's so much power in knowing how to remesh and knowing how to get to a nice kind of clean-ish mesh. Um, that will save you a lot of heartache later on. Even just as simple as posing will be so much easier if you just get really comfortable doing the remesh stuff. And they've made it so easy now. I used to refuse to teach remeshing in class because I was like, well, that's going to be lessons after lessons. And I remember the day they introduced uh, Z Remesher, I was like, guys, I'm going to teach you how to, Z remesh, or how to remesh. Okay, here we go. Click. All right, that looks good. Okay. Uh, it was a fantastic because I. I I like the art side of stuff. I don't like the technical side of stuff. I know the technical side as much as I have to, but if I can get away from it, that's where I'm happiest. So as you can see here, we have a very simple rat sculpt that I did, and then the crazy uh, mutant rats up here. Um, but what was fun about this is once I had one, if you look at the bottom one, I think I actually did before I did the guy up top, uh, in the middle, um, those little scales actually transferred onto this guy, and then I could just smooth out the bad areas and put new scales on it. These are very sloppy sculpts. I did these, uh, these three basically in a day plus the concept art. Sent them off, they got approved. I never really refined these until I did some 3D prints of them. Uh, and didn't even really refine them all that much. And you'll see when we bring up the concept that there can be a lot of uh, looseness. And these were some of the final model sheets just to show them what they looked like from all angles in pose. And here's some of the final concepts. Um, if we zoomed in, you'd see that these hairs are just crudely drawn on. Um, these whiskers are very, very cruelly drawn on. Um, but the idea was there, and uh, he loved the designs. They got approved within a day, fastest approval I've ever had. Felt really good about it. Should have known something was up. Uh, about six or four months later, we get the call going, and we've changed the whole sequence. You don't actually see it transform now, and it just looks like a monster. So we ended up doing uh, some other versions of them that were more... Uh, traditional rat. I did kind of a naked mole rat looking character. And this is pretty close to, I think, what showed up in the film, um, which is basically a green rat with big eyes and a little bit more muscles uh, and crazy teeth. But uh, again, very fast after we did that. But I always loved those initial two. So we ended up getting to do 3D prints of them at, way after the fact, just because we liked the designs and they were fun. And you can see some of the, uh, the prints here. But again, you know, with the right printer, all that detail shows up. So all the work you guys put into your ZBrush sculpts, it's only going to help you. And if you guys are using Keyshot a lot, 
Um, it's funny, I've been having this conversation a lot, but it's more and more the little extra push you do in ZBrush shows up in Keyshot. It just, it'll bring everything up to that next level. Keyshot has a, a tendency to soften things a little bit, so sometimes you want to overdo things a little bit for your Keyshot renders, I've found. Um, or just do a lot of comps, whatever, whatever needs to be done. Hopefully we'll have a chance to play a little bit with that. So you can see we keyed all this stuff so it was very easy to, uh, to print uh, at the scales that we had, and um, then very easy to assemble. Still haven't glued those guys, and there's the final one of him. Always kind of like this one. He had a funny little look on his face. Okay, so then we're going to get into uh, Godzilla a bit. Um, so this image I did, uh, this is really more fan art than production art. They told us we were going to get working on Godzilla. I didn't know anything about the movie other than Godzilla, obviously. And we were, we were kind of told, like, we're going to redesign the character and we get to imagine him. So that weekend I went home and did a couple designs, just two. Um, but they were really just done because I was excited. I couldn't wait to work on it. Um, this image was never seen by the director because when he came in, uh, the amazing guys at Weta had done, and other people, I shouldn't take away from anybody else who worked early on stages, but they had tons of initial designs. So we just took our prints and kind of pushed them aside, like we didn't want to rock the boat at all. Um, but it's funny because some of the ideas that I initially had of him being like a big kind of lumbering beast, it was great to see that they kept that in because that's one of my favorite aspects of the old silly, you know, rubber suit, uh, was that he wasn't like a lean, mean T-Rex, he was this just giant thing. Um, so when we got in, I actually, my job on it was to do more um, polish passes, really. Once again, kind of taking their initial stuff. I worked out the head a lot. I did a lot of some anatomy changes, some, a lot of scale work. <laughs> At this point, I've done a lot of scales. Uh, but it was um, a very fun project to work on. I love the character. So this is some initial work. You know, silly little things, but just to kind of show what I thought would be kind of fun to play with on a Godzilla character. Very rough sculpts. I would never show the sculpts on these. They're just really, really, really rough. And then you could see the final sculpt after um, all the different people got their hands on it, and this is kind of the final design. Uh, it was so cool to work on. I mean, the, the design was already cool to push it to that next final level to work out the color details and all that. Um, you could see a lot of this work in the Art of Godzilla book. Um, most of it was credited to the wrong artist, but uh, now you'll know, right? Uh, <laughs> But what can you do? You know, they, you, you're on a show for a little while and they don't, you know, they don't necessarily remember, they just remember the work and they're just trying to put a book together. So that does happen quite a bit. But, uh, you know, get to show some of these images. There's a back view of him. Giant, giant tail. And it was funny because we did a lot of work on the feet, the size of the tail, the size of the head. Initially his head was like a little pea up there. And finally they, they, they said, no, 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 it's got to be bigger because he's going to be so scaled up, it's going to look like nothing up there. So uh, there's a, there a lot of work on just figuring out the right scale of things and then the right scales on things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so then this was, this was the image I did. I did a ton of these different color passes, and this was kind of the final one. This is the one that uh, the director said, if that shows up in the movie, I'd be happy. So that was a great, great feeling to know, like this. And it, I think it showed up pretty damn close to this, so that was, was cool to see. Um, these are some of the Mutos. Uh, them, they were uh, really fun to work on. Worked really closely with uh, the production designer on these, and uh, he actually came and we did a lot of initial designs, which I can't show. I can only show the stuff that was in the book. Um, and then once they kind of got further along, I think MPC had done a ton of stuff. Um, I don't know that Weta did a ton on this, but I could be wrong, so let's just say they did. Uh, so, but when they came to this one, it was like a complete redesign. They had this very angular, like, painting drawings, just saying it needs to be, like, all angles. So you're trying to figure that out in sculpture, it's pretty difficult, especially when you start posing it, all those angles don't quite line up. So that was the real challenge on these characters. And then here's some early, uh, early designs. You can see it's much rounder at this point, and you kind of some striping going on. Um, but a lot of fun to work on these things, you know. I'm, anytime you get to work on a giant monster, it's kind of hard to complain, right? Uh, some color passes done early on, but you could see how angular these creatures were. And then this was the final uh, female, the smaller one. I think it was the smaller one. Uh, only image I could show from Jurassic World. So it's not much, but they used this on, I think, some marketing material, so I actually got permission to show it. Um, but I worked on a lot of creatures for that. Um, really, really fun show. I'm sure, like many of you, Jurassic Park was one of the most influential movies I ever saw. It literally, all I heard about was Star Wars, and I studied the work of ILM. I still have a Smithsonian magazine from 1992, which was into the archives at, uh, at ILM, showing all the practical stuff. Some of the digital stuff they were doing with uh, the Ghostbusters 2, some of the stuff they were doing um, 
on Indiana Jones, all this stuff. And I still have this magazine. My dad brought it to me and said, you know, hey, you're kind of interested in Star Wars. And I looked at this magazine and went, oh, I'm 12 years old, but this is what I'm going to do with my life. And, you know, to this day, it, it's, I still have it. So I can look back and go, hey, I kind of, kind of follow through. So it's funny that I went back to practical uh, in the weird roundabout way that I did because I always assumed that's what I would get into. However, Jurassic Park came around and I believe it was Phil Tippett uh, who was uh, famously quoted as saying, um, I think it was, uh, he was told, well, you might be out of a job. He said, don't you mean extinct? Now, that's obviously not the case. Practical is more important than ever. Uh, working with digital, there's a whole hybrid of things that are done. But uh, the story is kind of interesting to see how that worked out. Um, but yeah, so getting to come back and work on a Jurassic Park movie, which again, I still haven't seen, but I heard it's quite good. Um, got to work on these guys, the Morphodons, the big evil mutant dinosaurs. It, it was really, really fun. Um, and then we come to the book I worked on a little bit ago, Essence. Uh, this is available still. I think you can even buy it in the store back here. Maybe. Um, but uh, this was a great book. This is a collaborative effort with a ton of different artists and friends of mine uh, from the real world and some people I only know online and some people I just really admire. So I got to do the final pass on the cover, but a uh, bunch of other guys, I think it was um, uh, Baker and uh, Herman who did the design on this. And then I did the paint job on it and kind of made the cover uh, for this one. And it was a really fun project to work on. Brian Wynia was the artist who uh, kind of gathered uh, the, the people and kind of, it was like herding cats, I'm sure. So, but uh, we ended up making the book. So um, here's one of the creatures I did, the little manta pup, uh, kind of based on my uh, pets and my love of, if you ever look at a manta ray on the underside, they're really adorable. So um, I wanted to make a little creature that kind of was that. The idea between all the creatures I did was that they were going to be in an ecosystem. So these guys kind of fed on the dung of these other creatures. That's why they have these little scoopy arms. Um, they also have little flycatcher things for another one, but I never got around to, to fleshing that out. Um, they're kind of like mud skippers, basically. They're kind of aquatic, but not not really swimming around too much. They just kind of dwell in the water. So here's a poly-painted version of the character, um, all done in ZBrush on these ones. Uh, and then we get into some of the render passes, which we might not have a chance to do live today, but I just wanted to show what this workflow is. And here's the final image. Uh, little cute little guy. I think he's cute. And then some uh, really rough sketches of these little mosquito-y creatures that were going to be kind of bioluminescent, almost plant-based. Um, just that we're flying around, kind of vulture-y things. And here's a little bit of the process of sculpting these. Um, as you can see, started off pretty much from a sphere, uh, a little bit phallic, but okay, um, and kept going until they became these weird little flying uh, buggers. And here's the final sculpt. Um, a lot of detail on these. These were uh, remeshed, and this was remeshed before Z Remesher, so I actually had to do it in another program, bring it back in, project the detail back on it, and take it to the next level. Uh, now it's just so much easier. Color passes on an early version of trying to figure out what they were going to be. Um, some odd choices, watermelons down there and fleshy and all sorts of stuff. And then the final one with poly paint done. Uh, and then again, with the renders on these guys, they pretty much show up uh, as I did the poly painted. I didn't shift them too much. I had some versions, but I, uh, and there's a flying squadron of them going along, hunting for whatever they're going to eat. And there's the final image. Um, really fun creatures to work on, though. It was a really fun book to just get to make up your own creatures with no one telling you what to do. So very rare in this industry that you just get to kind of run wild. A little scary sometimes because all the mistakes are on you. <laughs> um, and then these guys were the stargazers. Uh, these ones were obviously more Photoshop on top of that initial sculpture. Uh, there they go to the final sculpt. Same process, dynameshing, remeshing, taking it into a final, reposing it. There he is painted up. Um, never really got a final render on this one I liked. So I'll show you the final image, but I would always wanted to go revisit this one. I, I like the creature, but I just don't think I really got it. I, I did too straight on one side and too flat on the front. So one day I'd like to revisit these guys. And then lastly, uh, these guys were done really quick. And this is when they introduced uh, Dynamesh, I believe. So what I ended up doing was doing this sculpt in about an hour and doing the comp passes in ZBrush and getting this final image down here. Uh, right here, it, and I think I timed myself, it was like three hours. And I was pretty darn impressed that I was able to do something from nothing to a final that quickly. Uh, I never really felt like that was possible until that new version of ZBrush, just how fast it could be. Uh, now it's commonplace. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then these are some images that were, were in the book, but very small. Uh, we had a house fire, so I ended up losing all these creatures. Um, but these were the initial round of creatures I was doing, uh, which never got fully developed. And then I'll just cruise through this stuff really fast. We'll do some live demo. But uh, some personal works, my, uh, my own little house imp. I did a 3D print of him. Again, Harry Potter fan, so this was my version of a house elf. And uh, it's not all monsters for uh, people who are kind of sick of that kind of stuff. Um, this was a, a headdress piece that we did for um, Snow White, uh, which I don't know if it showed up in the final idea, but it was going to be this huge headdress of carved beetles, 3D printed about this big, hollow. They were amazing looking. And uh, also did my wedding toppers. So that was on the wedding cake. Aww. Aww, painted up and everything. So if my wife Hillary is in here, I'm not sure if she made it or not, but yep, yep, that's, uh, that's us as penguins. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the slideshow there. Cool, I think we're doing all right. So we're gonna do a little live demo stuff. Now, I don't have time to do something from scratch, I don't have time to do something polished, but I wanted to kind of show you the workflow in pieces and we can kind of talk about what goes into it. Um, now, I'm not sure how you wanna do the Q&A, do you wanna do it just at the end? No, they can do it at the end. Yeah, I'm happy to do it while I'm working if you guys wanna like ask questions, if I'm doing stuff. I'm gonna assume you guys oh. have ZBrush knowledge, so you, I might jump you, forward. You've already got one. I've already got a question. You've okay. already got a question. It's let's, live let's on the do floor, question we get coming at you. <laughs> Uh, for something that you're taking to a really deep level of detail, how many times would you say you're, you're remeshing? That's a good question. Um, if I'm designing the creature or character, um, I could be remeshing a heck of a lot. Because it will be remeshing, uh, projecting it back on, turning back to Dynamesh sometimes. If you're like, this thing needs four arms now, fine. It, it really is pretty fast to go back and forth these days. Um, back in the day, not too often, it would be like the final pass I would do that on. But now it's so quick, it could be two or three times depending on the final. Um, I've gotten pretty good at figuring out where I'm going on things, so usually it's a Dynamesh rough, which I get to about 70%. I don't even care if the proportions are great. It's more about like my limbs, head, basics are all there, even the fingers, just something, and I make everything a little extra spread out than I really like to sculpt it, so that when I remesh it, I don't have any fusion happen. And then very quickly, I'll repose it so it looks a little bit more natural and start sculpting on it and take it to the next level. Um, and these days, it's rare that I actually go back and have to Dynamesh that and remesh it, unless there's like a, a mandate from a director or uh, an idea that comes along that you're like, oh wow, I just gotta completely add a hole into the side of his back or something like that. Well then yeah, I'll remesh it. But uh, I also use Z-Modeler a, a lot these days for that kind of work, where I might uh, do an initial remesh, go back to the lowest level, duplicate it, delete the higher level, change that mesh a little bit. Maybe I'm just gonna do something simple like go, wow, I need a couple more loops in the eyes. And so I'll just do uh, panel loops or, um, or using the Z-Modeler and just go in there and inset a couple times. Bring it back to the other one, go to the lowest level, import it back at zero, and it'll automatically project all my stuff back on there, and then I've got more loops to play with there. Or the opposite, I may have remeshed something, done all this work and realized, wow, his uh, lower extremities have a ton of loops in them. That's probably like 100,000 polygons that don't matter. So I'll go in and remove some loops and go back in and do it. So that, that's more what I'm doing these days than having to like completely remesh a character. It's more tweaking stuff after the fact. But hopefully that makes some sense. Um, so I'm going to take you guys through uh, the process of one of these critters I did for, um, this was actually done for Mold 3D, a cool group. If you guys are interested in 3D printing, they do some wonderful workshops. Uh, they, are, they do a lot of zebra stuff. Um, they're really, really f nice guys, and they do some great, great stuff in terms of learning about 3D printing, especially on a consumer level, which I think is really useful, because you know, I was very lucky that I got to jump in at a place like Legacy for a while that had these amazing printers to have access to. Hi, Em. Uh, <laughs> it's my daughter, I think, back there. Um, but w once you kind of do that for so long, going to a consumer level, people just assume you know how to do it, and you're like, ah, no, I kind of had access to Magics. There's a really $10,000 software that did all of my Booleans and all this stuff. So it's kind of fun to go back into it and start learning things from a consumer level, because if you can do it with the basis of tools, then having all the fancy stuff, you know you can do it. Um, we've actually gotten amazing prints on, uh, on, mol on um, uh, even, uh, what are they called, uh, MakerBots. Um, uh, Jason Lopes from Legacy uh, really just loves 3D printing, so everything from the lowest level to the highest level he will just tweak and crank and get these just beautiful, beautiful results. 
So um, pretty amazing stuff. We actually had like pore detail on a, on a MakerBot print about this big. So pretty, pretty impressive. So I'm gonna take you through a little bit of my process on uh, sculpting this character, and then we'll go to the final. So I start with a sphere. Almost always when I'm starting a new character, I'll start from a sphere. This was gonna be a bust, so it's just a head, but if I'm doing a full character, I like to start with a torso. This gives me a little bit more proportion to work with and then put the head on um, and then tweak from there. So duplicated the sphere. A um, little trick that a lot of people don't know about, I was kind of surprised to find out, you can duplicate things that don't have subdivision levels. So my first little tip to give you, let's say we have our sphere here and we're gonna turn it into a dynamesh. Oh heck, we don't even have to do dynamesh just yet. All I have to do is hold control and use the middle transpose line and I'll duplicate that piece. If you guys didn't know this, this is a huge time saver. Maybe I'm just uh, slow in the head, but I just, I didn't know about this until recently. And <laughs> I went, oh my God, this is so cool. I can just duplicate my parts and stretch them around. And it's just much, much faster for me than always using insert brushes, because you, know, you have to worry about scale. So uh, this was a great way for me to work. And I'll show you guys a little bit of the uh, process on a full character too. So I duplicated it, head and torso. Now I dynameshed it. Um, I'm just gonna cruise through. I'm guessing you guys know the basics of some of this. Then I started working out proportions, continued working out proportions, and started, I'm always thinking about the underlying anatomy. Now, I knew this character was gonna be this fat, kind of genie character, but um, I wanted to start thinking about the skeleton structure underneath and also the big masses of uh, fat that were gonna be involved. So to begin with, I started to kind of shave away some of the fat and just worry about the, the basic skeletal structure. So if we actually look at this, this one, you start to see you got my ocular cavity, my zygomatic arch, everything's kind of coming into place where you go, yeah, that's, a, that's the skeletal structure of this character. Then I just got silly and I started making him into a weird bat thing, I don't know. Sometimes I go back and forth. Didn't like that, took it away for a little bit. Then I started thinking it'd be fun that instead of having like a, one of the traditional hats, maybe he was just gonna have this big, big flopping piece of skin back there. Then you, I thought maybe it should be just a bulging cranium that kind of went over. Did we have a question? You got a question here on the floor. Sure, please. I guess you're sort of answering this right now, but so do you ever start with like a 2D concept before you, or do you typically just concept? I honestly, uh, very rarely. I do sometimes, um, often for my own personal work, or if I'm like in a meeting, I'll sketch some very rough things. Uh, but I, I honestly find ZBrush so fast these days that I am faster doing it here and solving it from all angles rather than coming down with one idea. That being said, sketching is a really important tool to have in your arsenal because if you're in a meeting and someone needs to understand what you're talking about and you don't have your laptop and everything set up, if you can just sketch it, you might be able to sell the idea right there. And if you know your ZBrush and everything well enough, you can just go sculpt it in and make it look even cooler then. So yes, I still do it occasionally. Very rarely do I do a final concept and then jump in. I do my concepting 99% in ZBrush. Even if it's just gonna be like this rough of a model, rendered out and taken into, key, into Keyshot and painted on. But what's great about this is even if I just use the simple um, uh, ZBrush lighting, is I can always get a quick shadow pass and a quick uh, form study right there. And then I have all of my colors to sample right away. I don't have to worry about making it up from whole cloth. So it's very easy for me to tell my plane changes because I've already got this rough sculpt. This kind of way is happening more and more in concept art. Even the guys who do environments and vehicles are doing things in Moto and ZBrush, very rough, nothing, or even SketchUp, very, very rough. But it gives them their perspective, it gives them their basic idea, take it into Photoshop, and if you're a brilliant painter, you're gonna make that thing sing and you're never gonna know there was 3D to begin with. If you're more of a 3D guy, you're gonna be able to get rid of the kind of CG stink that a lot of this stuff has. Um, so I think the skill set, if you're interested in concept art, is you could pick one or the other at this stage, uh, especially in film, games are a little more 2D centric. Um, but you could pick one or the other to be really your strong point, but always have a little bit of that backup. And you know, I'm starting to see guys who didn't jump into ZBrush, who didn't jump into some 3D, who are great concept guys, not getting their designs through because they're not able to take it to that final pass. And that final pass these days is, here's what you're gonna have on film. You're, that's, you're, that's what it's gonna look like. And if you can get there, a lot of times you'll sell your design right away. Not always a good thing. Sometimes you miss the idea of uh, uh, ideation, you miss the idea of iteration and improvement because your, your first design can sometimes look so final that it might get approved. So I'm of two minds with the idea where sometimes I like things to be a little rougher first before you just commit to this crazy, you know, beautifully rendered thing because that might end up being in the movie and you realize like, oh, I made some really rough choices there and that's not great. 
Um, so, you know, I think it's really important to have both skills. So I'm going to jump through these guys pretty quick now because a lot of it was uh, just solving forms. Here is where I made probably the biggest change. And I believe I, uh, yeah, I'm still in DynaMesh on this stage, as you can see. Um, I don't take my DynaMesh up very far. But you can get a lot of detail in this way. So it's really not a bad thing. Uh, if you take anything away from what I'm kind of talking about, um, you might notice, and I don't know how obvious it is, but a lot of times when I'm working, I'm working from about here. And I'm worrying about my silhouette and my main form, and I'll do some quick renders to see how that form is actually going. Um, if this works, one of the best lessons I ever learned, if it works from across the room, it's going to work when you put it up in your face. All the detail is icing on the cake, but you need it to read from a distance first. OK, so then this is the next big stage. So at this point, I've re-remeshed re it. Wait, Z-remeshed it. Um, and I started to add in a few little things. Uh, eyeballs, I like to have them separate to get a little glint in the eye. And there's something I like to do. I recommend you do this when you're studying things on your own characters. Hard to do on a, uh, on a final character. This was for an earlier version, this skull. I don't know. I don't think I did. But I'll often do this. I'll make a little uh, skull study when I'm trying to understand the underlying form. And maybe we should go back and find that version that actually ties into this head. I believe it was the uh, weird bat guy. Yeah, here we go. So that's pretty close. It might have been really this one or the one before, but hopefully you get the idea. Uh, but the idea is I know where my teeth are going. I know where my muzzle really needs to loop over. So I do this a lot of times when I'm, if I'm struggling with an anatomy problem. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do like a beautiful écorché, but uh, if there's a part you don't understand as well, do a quick skull study, do a quick plane study, pop it in there, and, all, and I teach students this all the time. It's amazing how quickly you'll see where your flaws are. You'll, you'll do this and you'll go, oh my god, no wonder the problem is he doesn't have, uh, there's nowhere for his teeth to go. Like, otherwise his teeth, his, his skull is going to be recessed where that, that's the problem. Or, oh, my cranium wasn't quite big enough. So maybe as I'm doing this, I, I might even tweak the skull to match what I did and see where it falls apart. Maybe the cheeks need to be further out. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now this is also a really fun way to make zombies. So if we're going to do this, especially if you've got a really nice skull model you've made or that you bought online or whatever. Um, you could start oh, carving them away and we have our cool walking dead ogre guy. Um, it can be a really fun way to work on that level too. So the better the skull matches what you're doing, the better it's going to be, of course. But uh, that's just one little thing I sometimes like to do. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be super tight, but it, it just helps a little bit. So I believe the last pass that we left off on was this one here, whoops, with eyeballs, teeth, and his little chin thing. This was my rough design, basically. Uh, this gave me the idea of where I wanted him to go. And then we'll pop into the final design. So this, should, this is all still DynaMesh. I guess those eyes were a little bit off. Doesn't really matter, because I just got everything where it needed to be initially. So once I was happy with this, I took the character to a final state. Now, this might seem a little bit like that uh, internet meme you've probably seen a million times with, uh, first, how to draw an owl. Here's the circle. Now draw the rest of the frickin' owl. <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of what you're seeing here. But at the same time, it's not. You got the idea of what you're working on here. And then what I did is I remeshed it, which you saw before. Took the ears out, made sure that everything read pretty well. Added a little uh, nose area or a mouth area. If we look at the eyes, you'll see I, I just made sure they had some simple loops. I didn't need this to be perfect. Um, some people would look at this mesh and go, what the heck are you doing? Um, what I needed it to be was just something that was going to hold up to add my detail and sculpt. So all my form was kind of where I needed it to be. This was going to be printed about this big. So I just needed to make sure it looked good about this big on my screen, and I was going to be OK. So once I got the sculpt finished, it was about making accessories. Now, if you look at these, most of these are probably just DynaMesh things that I just pulled off. I never even bothered to remesh them. And again, these were for sculpts, so I didn't want to go too crazy with the hair. I wanted it to be something that was going to hold up when I printed it out. The rings and all that kind of stuff, the same idea. Um, and then when it came into pore detail, we can talk about that a bit if you guys are interested. But um, really, detail is the kind of the last thing that matters. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, so I kind of don't dwell on that too much. 
Uh, directional pores are important. Um, areas of rest are more important than anything else. Having big areas that don't draw too much attention to focus on the areas that have a lot of detail. It's something that a lot of people don't do. A lot of people just were like, detail everywhere, look how cool that is. And it's not that cool. It's just hard to look at a lot of times. So that's one thing I always try to kind of keep in mind. Um, so what I'd like to do is a little bit of poly painting. Um, unless you guys have questions about this process. How are we doing on time? Doing OK? You got 10 yeah, like minutes. Another, uh, you 10 got 12 minutes. minutes. We started late, so okay, you got 12 cool. minutes. Cool. Louis liked what really liked to open up the show. What's that? Louis liked to open the show with a bang, so he went a little longer. That's right. I was, yeah. Where's the confetti? I thought that usually yeah. happened. I no, that was confetti. feathers yesterday with his I bowl. saw some feathers in the back room. I thought like a pigeon exploded or something. No. <laughs> Louis. Is it magic tricks? Oh, that was, uh, oh, the feather boa. That's what that is. I see. Not only do you guys learn cool ZBrush tricks here, you're also going to learn about high fashion and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so anyway, this guy was kind of a genie character. So let's just, uh, I never actually got around to painting color on him. So we're going to do this a little bit live. Um, I think I like the idea of him being kind of a greenish blue. So to begin with, whenever I'm going to do this, I like to start off with a uh, big base pass of the color. So let's just turn that on right now. Color, fill object. So. I'm going to turn off all the other layers just so we can work. And sometimes they look really funny when you do this if they've got teeth and they don't have it. They look like little baby people, but uh, that's okay. So we're going to start working on this guy. You could do this earlier on. I like to start color usually a lot earlier when I'm doing things, but I knew this was for a 3D print, so I didn't actually do that. I, I detailed them up. So the first thing I want to do is make uh, some, some big breakup happen on him. So I think what I'm going to do is play a little bit with some highlight, turn my RGB down a little bit. Maybe go a little more yellowy. Dare I do it? And he's asymmetrical, so while I'm painting him, I'm going to keep him rather asymmetrical. I think it's going to add a little something to him too. So this is going to look a little bit, um, a little bit weird at first, but it's really just blocking in some uh, some some primary color breakup and see what I like. And I like to be kind of experimental at this stage. Some people are very, uh, they have a methodo methodological uh, process for working on that. But um, sometimes I just like to discover and see what's going to look good. It's going to have a little bit of a 5 o'clock shadow to go with his stubble. Maybe a little bit of warmth in some of these areas would look nice. So we'll start painting in some lips. Inside of the mouth could look good. It's really nothing too crazy. I, I really based a lot of the way I do poly painting by watching uh, friends of mine who work in practical effects and uh, some of the old guys who are just masters of this stuff and seeing how they approached it. Because really, when you think about poly painting, what are you doing? You're airbrushing on a model, right? You're doing little stippling effects. You're doing little uh, uh, you know, big washes of color. You're, it's, it's really pretty darn similar. So if you guys get a chance, I recommend that you watch videos of how people actually airbrush these characters and uh, see, what, see what you can learn. Sometimes it's um, really useful. Same with sculpting. Watch how these guys handle form. Watch how these guys handle this stuff. Because like, I got really back into practical uh, sculpting once I started a legacy again, because it was, um, I just watched these guys and I was like, there's, there's so much value in having that knowledge. And the digital tools are just a tool, but if you don't understand the theory, you're really not going to be able to achieve the results that you're trying to achieve. And it's a lifelong struggle. I mean, even the guys who do this all the time, are constantly learning, constantly watching videos, constantly trying to find that little breakthrough, the little aha moments. So here's, here's a good question for Twitter, since you're poly painting, from Fernando, um, which is, Ian, do you have a specific lighting settings you do when you're poly painting? Uh, no, uh, I don't. I actually move the lighting around. I like to use a basic material, um, sometimes with a shine on it, but really the basic one without shine is nice because it's not going to trick me too much. But I do like these two basic materials. Um, the, uh, the one with the highlight is really nice for me to read form, so when I'm sculpting, I'm often using this one. And when I'm doing this, I like to use uh, the basic material because it's a little truer to color. Um, the main reason I use these basic materials, or skin, skin can be nice, but it's very bright, as you can see. So I end up, when I use that one for painting, sometimes I go over the top with my colors because it's so washed out. Um, so it all depends. Also, if there's some reason that I'm going to do uh, passes in ZBrush, I might be like, well, what's my base pass going to be? Um, but the main reason I like to use the basic materials over matte caps is lighting is so important in your sculpture. And it's something that I don't see people do too often. But if you watch traditional sculptors, they always have a lamp, and they're always watching how the shadow play on it, right? Well, we should be doing that in ZBrush, too. 
um, you're really going to see, and it, unfortunately it's not real time exactly, but it's so darn fast that it's pretty close to it. And we do have our fake uh, shadows to kind of give us an idea. I know some very, very talented practical guys and digital guys who, when they got into 3D printing, uh, myself included, made some um, horrible mistakes because you look on the screen and you think like, oh yeah, that looks great proportionally, or that looks like it's really concave, that's wonderful. And you print it out and you don't realize because you weren't looking with real shadow, things weren't deep enough, things were actually convex, things were proportionally not where they need to be. Um, to give ZBrush a little bit more props though, they actually changed uh, the way that the camera works in it a few versions back, and I have not had that issue of proportion come up so much. I used to always bring my models into 3D Studio Max to, to see what the uh, real proportion in the real world is gonna be. Now I'm pretty darn happy with just the default camera in ZBrush. I get a pretty good idea of what I'm gonna expect from stuff. Make sure, and when you're sculpting and painting, I like to have perspective on, unless there's a reason to turn it off. So again, I don't have another version of this guy to just jump to, which would be nice, but um, I'd like to just keep doing some poly painting if you guys are up for it. Then we'll get into a little bit more uh, detail past stuff. So, you know, he's a genie character, so he might be a little more over the top in his color choices. We're going to get in and do some modeling pretty soon, because he's a little bit uh, airbrushy at this moment. But I do like to keep things kind of airbrushy to begin with. Another little trick I sometimes do, especially on characters like this that have a very defined end point, is maybe I'll use a little bit of darkness in the poly paint to just guide the eye a little bit more. It's almost like if you took an ambient occlusion pass and uh, in Photoshop layered it on there, you'd have a very similar kind of result. So I'll do the same kind of thing where I want to pop out shadows a little more. Maybe those eyes are going to like really pop with some glowing color. Now, another little trick, which I'm sure most of you guys know, but maybe not, is to use back face masking when you're painting stuff, especially ears. Like the inside of the ears are great to be, uh, to be that little red, but I maybe don't want the outside to be that way. So by turning on back face masking, I can paint on these, this side and not have it affect the other side. You may have to tweak your brush slightly to, uh, to make sure it's not overly large uh, so that it's not popping through, but that is one thing I really like to do. Also, when you're sculpting, turning on back face masking. So here's another question from Twitter. Please. You got about five minutes, just so you know, too. Okay, cool. I'm going to jump into some more detailed stuff. Sure. Though. Jason Fernandez wants to know, what is your workflow for transparency, translucency in some of your creature concepts? Almost all the translucency you see I paint. I don't usually have time to do skin renders. I wish I could because sometimes they look so beautiful. But um, time is of the essence in concept. And oftentimes the finish polish is not as important as the idea. So I end up doing a lot of painting with a lighten layer in Photoshop and uh, just kind of doing enough um, studies of translucency, I'm able to get something that kind of works. Uh, it's not perfect. Now when it comes to transparency, I'm sorry ZBrush, but nothing beats Keyshot. It's beautiful. If I'm doing robot stuff, it's going to Keyshot because you're going to have glass, you're going to have illumination, you're going to have all these beautiful things. And um, so when I do these kind of these creatures, sometimes I just love a ZBrush render. But when I get into robots or vehicles or environments, um, Keyshot really becomes the, the champion uh, on that level. Um, so, and the two of these programs, I honestly think Photoshop, ZBrush, and Keyshot together are just, uh, they're a dream team. They all complement the areas where the other ones kind of uh, maybe don't uh, have the strengths. Um, I'd love to do a little, I don't have time, but I'd love to show you guys, so I'm hoping someone will, uh, some of the setup for Keyshot where you actually build lights in ZBrush and you can do really controlled lighting with it. What's nice about that is uh, Keyshot has a tendency to make things look like product renders, which is a benefit to probably 99% of the people who use Keyshot, but it's a real bummer for us character artists and concept artists who want to have a little bit more dy dynamis, dynam dynam dynamic uh, images. <laughs> um, so what I like to do is make these lights so that I can go in and, um, and really control d dynamic lighting. I used to always do it in ZBrush because I could get these beautiful render passes, put them in, and I just knew that things were going to look fantastic. Uh, but once you get into, uh, into, into Keyshot, a lot of times things wash out. So I'll turn my HDR lighting down to almost nothing, and I'll turn the, um, the lights that I have on to like, sometimes even up into the thousands to get the, uh, to get the look I want. There we go. So, Let's just, uh, let's just jump into a little bit more detail work on the poly painting since it looks like that's what we're going to have time for. <laughs> okay, cool. 
So one of my first uh, little things I love to use is mask by cavity. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, hopefully by now it's become a little more commonplace, but a couple of years back I remember no one knew about this little thing and you almost hated to teach people about it because it was like, how do I make my detail pop? Mask by cavity, all right. Um, but it is such a powerful thing. So we can go in here now. I have a mask on, I've just hidden the mask. And there's two ways you can go about doing, oops, I have to invert that. Two ways I can go about doing this. I can um, make it so that my, uh, uh, the dirt is basically being caught in the crevices. So you see that a lot of dinosaurs and things where they're, uh, they're gonna be brighter. Or you could go the opposite direction and maybe you want your, uh, your crevices to pop out and keep the skin the other way. Either way is totally fine. So sometimes I like to just play with uh, a little bit of contrasting color to, to add more individual interest in those crevices. Kind of look kind of cool. Again, we're going a little over the top with some of the color choices on him since he's kind of hyper real as opposed to the normal kind of look. But what you'll start to notice, and uh, you might notice I do things a little bit layered up, what you'll start to notice is that these details really start to pop out. You don't want to go over the top with it, though. You want to keep things, uh, you know, subtle. It's going to really help. So sometimes with the mask by cavity, though, it's not quite where you want it. So I'm going to turn the 100% all the way up. I'm going to ramp this up because I want some really crazy tight uh, uh, detail pass and just kind of find where it's going to work, Oops. work the best. So that looks pretty good. And again, I'm using a very low uh, opacity. I'm going to invert that, actually. I like the uh, opposite direction for this, I think. Maybe. Maybe we'll go with just a little bit of that. Yeah, that's looking better. So that's one pass we can do. Another little fun trick that I like to use, uh, using some of these masks. As you can see, this stuff starts to pop out a little bit, but still pretty airbrushy. So now we really got to kind of model this thing up and give it a little bit more uh, interest. So what we're going to do is we are going to uh, play with a couple of these things. Color spray is one I really like. Uh, toss on a little bit of a scatter brush. Um, by default, there's some great alphas with ZBrush that really work well with this. Uh, this one's a little more organic. You got a um, question on the floor here. Please. Um, layer painting, so you can try to layer up your different layers of painting. Oh, uh, like using layers for painting? Yeah, do you use layers in ZBrush for painting? If I, I shouldn't say anything bad about ZBrush in this conference. <laughs> okay, layer, layer painting has a real problem, and uh, it's caused me a lot of grief, so I don't use layer painting. Um, if you may have noticed that if you toggle it on and off, layers tend to ghost a little bit, and uh, that's just with geometry, but with color, um, there's some, some kind of serious issues that I would love to see resolved. I, I love ZBrush. Please don't take this in the wrong way. I've learned ways to work around it. The, uh, the issue especially is with KeyShot. Sometimes if you do layer painting and you send it to KeyShot, you get this black, weird material that looks like it's like inverted pixels and things. There is a way around that though. You just turn off your layers and bake them and then send them over. So it can work. I do occasionally use it. But because of my issues I've had in the past, I don't do it too often. Generally, what I'll do is I'll make a UV map for the character very quickly with the amazing uh, Z plugin, and uh, then I'll save texture maps off that way. For me, that's been the way to go. Um, again, I hate to say anything ill of the program because it is a wonderful, game-changing, life-changing program. But uh, yeah, layers are something that I would, uh, I usually avoid right now. So I'll take one more question here from Twitter. You got a couple minutes. Uh, Rodrigo wants to know, what was your advice for the resolution with Dynamesh for good detail? I see I, you're using 512. Uh, you like yeah, to keep I, it low, right? I keep it very low. 512 would be usually my max. Um, I start it at 32, and I double it up every time. So it's like 32, 64, 128. Um, and then about 512, 768, I'm usually done. I usually, maybe 1024 if I'm really just having fun in Dynamesh. But at that point, your, your, your computer's, pro even with a fast computer, you're going to start struggling a bit. So I generally just, uh, I just Z remesh it. And um, ZBrush loves stuff that has low geometry to go back to. And you'll notice it, and Paul, you can tell me if I'm right about this, but ZBrush is always referencing back 
to the lowest resolution, I believe. And that's why one of its little magic tricks on how it can go so quick. You'll notice that even if I probably deleted the uh, subdivisions on him and started moving him around, the computer would be a little bit chuggier. Um, you might have uh, ever seen when you're like doing some detailing that it only has like a strange little area that shows it. And I believe it's because ZBrush is able to just kind of say, no, this is the important area right now. I don't got to think about everything else, um, which is great. So it's one reason I don't like staying in Dynamesh for too long is because by the time that it gets to the detail pass you see here, I'd be so high resolution that I'd be struggling with the computer as opposed to just letting my design come through the way I want it. So using the tools that they've given us, uh, you never really have to have that issue. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of, it just gives you more freedom. Like one thing I like to do is I might do a whole pass on this guy and then realize, you know what? He would look cooler if I stretched out his neck all the way down to here. I don't know, maybe that's the way he needs to look. All right, let's take one last question here and then you're done for the night. Cool. Hold on. Yeah, Ian, uh, I've noticed that you're using uh, a very similar color template, uh, color temperature that you would use in a human on this character. In which one? A color, yeah, yeah, color yeah. temperature. Yeah. And I was wondering if, if you find that to be universal across a lot of things, or that you find variations in more um, complex alien races and things Humanoid like that. characters, I do. Uh, they just they look alive when you do that. When I found when I try to go break the mold too much, generally things look a little dead. Um, you, do, don't, you don't, don't want to go too far with it. Obviously, he's kind of in these greens and... But you know the stubble is going to be a dark color because that's the color of his hair eventually. Um, the blood that he's going to have is going to be warm, so I like to have a little bit of warmth in the cheeks. Um, but honestly, this is the first pass of color. This will evolve as I go. Um, but yeah, usually when I'm doing like full-on creature stuff, that's where I get a little more bold with my color choices. The more humanoid stuff, especially stuff like this that's a little cartoony, um, I do like to kind of keep it in those zones. It just seems to work better. But uh, you know, personal preference and also probably a little bit of laziness on my part. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got to wrap up. Okay, well, sorry, guys. I was hoping to get a little further with it, but... Uh, Ian Joyner, everybody.